We're going to dive right into gospel goals. This is our series from Galatians. We spent the last two weeks taking a deeper look at this one letter that Paul writes. Uh, it's, you know, New Testament has a lot of letters to churches as the churches are starting up and Christianity is taking off and lives are being changed and hope is being restored and people are being healed. Can we say amen to all of that? It's a little chilly. I'm going to have you say some things uh, just to keep us going. But we're going to look at Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. So we're in the third chapter. We did the first chapter the first week, second chapter the second week. We're in the third chapter. This, this book can be very, uh, it's so doctrine heavy that you can get lost with, with the humanity of it, which we tried to put across in the first couple of weeks. It's a letter from somebody who really cares about the church and what would be modern day Turkey. He is concerned about some stuff that's going on. And as a matter of fact, I think God has something for us in this book to build up our faith, to build up our faith in these days. I, as a pastor, want to see your faith built up. I want to see you be able to withstand the storms. How many people have had storms in 2021? 2021. It's been a, it's been a year. And, but God wants you to be strong in your faith. And there's a way to do that. There's a way to get strong in our faith, to go deeper. And God is surely speaking to so many of us, uh, drawing us closer to him. How many people know that Jesus changes our lives, completely changes us, completely uh, renews us? So it says, we're going to not read the whole chapter this time. I've got three sections, and I want to give you a third gospel goal. So the first gospel goal uh, was to please, live to please God, live to please him. You know what men say, what people say, this world is full of opinions, you know, I like to think of it this way. If you're in the arena, you, want, you don't need people from the stands shouting at you. You want somebody who stands in the arena with you. Say amen to that. And that's what Paul was saying. I know Jesus is with me. I'm actually with Jesus in the arena. And so all the people shouting at me from the stands, I can't hear you because I am only listening to the voice of Jesus. That's gospel goal number one. Gospel goal number two last week was promoting grace. And we're going to talk something similar this morning, and I believe that God wants to help you with this. So it says in Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 to 3, reading from the New Living Translation, it starts off this letter, says, Oh, foolish Galatians. Let's just put the brakes on that for just a second. Oh, foolish Galatians. Another version in the message version, it says, You crazy people, how have you lost your mind? Paul is clearly got an issue with the churches there in Galatia, and he's got something to say, oh, foolish Galatians, oh, foolish Galatians. How many people understand that you can live your faith but have some foolishness going on in your life that needs to get sorted out? Paul is saying this in love. He's saying, oh, you foolish Galatians, what's at stake? What's at heart? Well, actually, what was happening was this incredible, uh, you know, the 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 message of the gospel, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the Jewish nation had kind of claimed an exclusivity on that. But what was happening, as Peter announced, Peter said, listen, this gospel isn't just for uh, Israel. It's for the whole world. Say the whole world. It's for the whole world. And so as uh, the, the Jewish Christians were coming together with those who were the non-Jewish or Gentile Christians, they're coming together in one space and they're coming together, and the Jewish Christians are, are saying, okay, we believe this message, we believe this message, um, but we just want you to add something to it. Just, just add a little bit to it. We know the gospel message, we've heard about it on the cross, but we want you to add something to it. It was almost as if he said to Paul, Paul, all you're saying to us is that if we believe in the message of the cross, if we believe that Jesus, when he died on the cross, that the work was finished. If that's all, if that's all there is to it, we believe, that we, just, we believe that, but we want to add something else. And they were trying to add another rule. And they were trying to get the Gentile Christians to come in and say, we're not saying you can't follow Jesus. We're just saying if you follow Jesus, you also have to do this. And I just want to say to the church right now, whenever somebody's preaching or teaching you about the gospel, about what it is to follow Jesus, don't let them put conditions where God never put conditions on it. It was as if they were saying to Paul, Paul, you're making this too simple. 
We got some other stuff that we think that people need to follow. And Paul was saying, I am not going to do that right from the start. He wanted the people who were going to follow Jesus to understand that the grace of God is so amazing and it sometimes sounds too good to be true because in a way it is too good to be true because none of us deserve the love of Jesus. And Paul was saying, amen, and Paul was saying, you foolish Galatians, because you're trying to do this, but you're saying based on a condition. So we don't want to make the same mistake. He goes on, who has cast an evil spell on you? (laughs) He had an attitude. For the meaning of Jesus Christ's death was made as clear to you as if you had seen a picture of his death on the cross. He was saying you need to get your eyes back onto Jesus. Can we all say refocus? How, how, How many of us understand that we really do need to refocus back onto the cross? with all the noise in your life and with all the struggles and the weariness and the problems that you have, where the answer is, is the message of the cross. The message of the cross. He was saying, you have seen this before. You have seen the power of it. How many people know about the power of Jesus Christ to change our lives? And it is the refocus. He says to the church in Galatia, I need you to refocus. I need you to get your eyes back. Get away from all this nonsensical, traditional stuff that is a rule and another way to follow God. And if you just do this, Paul was saying to the church, I need you to refocus. You already know how clear the message was. I need you to get your eyes back on Jesus. And it is so easy to lose our focus on who Jesus really is. It's so easy. And I see that in our lives. I see that in my life. There's times when I just need to say, okay, I need to refocus, put my eyes back on Jesus. And he says, let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying, sounds so good, by obeying the law of Moses? Of course not. You received the Spirit because you believed the message you heard about Christ. How foolish can you be? After starting your new lives in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? I have five moments in my life that are defining moments. I think they would be obvious to you, but one of them would be when I got married. That's, that's one. When we had our first daughter. When we had our second daughter. Number four would be when I was 15 years old. And I had already prayed prayers of salvation, but this prayer at 15 years old radically changed my life. It was a moment in which I always say I was baptized in dirty water. The people who led me to Christ also led me astray. That can happen. But I was baptized in dirty water, but at 15 years old, let me tell you, one of my defining moments was when I prayed a prayer and said, above what anybody else thinks, above what my family thinks, above what my friends think back home, I want to make Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior. That was my fourth defining moment. I have a fifth one that I want to tell you. Probably 15 years later, 15 years later, after that moment, I'm I'm in my early 30s. I had spent 15 years living in a culture, living in a climate that was very legalistic. And it was man-made. And I remember when I was 15 15 years old and I gave my life to Jesus in that way. I remember. You know the, 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 the story that... People say the grass is greener and the sky is bluer. Well, for me, that was true. It was was an experience. I was bawling. I couldn't believe how good my God was. Hands up if you know God is good. I was 15 years old, and I just, I I got some boldness in me. I got some fire of the Holy Spirit in me. And I could come back and tell my friends about Jesus. I was fired up about the gospel, but over 15 years after that, it was a subtle rebuilding away from the righteousness of Jesus, and not in any intention of my heart, to be honest with you. I believe I have a heart for God, but over 15 years rebuilding my own system of righteousness and wearing myself out trying to be a good person, wearing myself out trying to keep all the rules that church was giving me, wearing myself out thinking about 
what my sin is and how to get free from sin and how to get closer to God. And after 15 years, I was pretty worn out with what we call the Christian faith. Has anybody, anybody been worn out by faith at times? Raise, raise your hand. It's okay. Jamie's got her hand. We know what it's like at times to wear ourselves out by trying to follow what, what Paul is saying is the law. Trying to follow all the rules, trying to be a better person, and in myself, only finding, I've said this to you so many times, when you give the devil the pen and you say, what else is my sin? He adds to the list. And my list was long. It wasn't the freedom that I thought I was going to walk in at 15 years old, but at 30, I had a defining moment. And it's not that big of a moment that you would think is like, you know, a trumpet from heaven. It's watching TV. It's watching Joyce Myers trying to get myself holier than I was the day before. And she was describing a problem that she had with her religious pride, how she sat down in a waiting room at a, at a doctor's office, and she broke out her big book, and she was, I think it was just a big study Bible, and she started highlighting everything. And, but this older gentleman was sitting in the waiting room, and he just wanted to talk. And she was like, oh, I'm trying to be so spiritual. And he just wanted to say something to her. He just was a lonely guy, older guy, and he wanted to talk to her. And she, the way she was describing the story began to kind of break through my take myself too serious attitude. And I began to laugh a little bit. And, and she, just, she, she, just, she shares a story about how she felt like the Lord spoke to her and said, I know you got that big Bible in front of you, but what if that guy next to you was Billy Graham? Would you treat him that way? And she just, she said, oh, I'm so stupid. So foolish. I got myself all tangled up. And I just remember watching this in, in my living room, watching this show, being really down and hard on myself. And I began to laugh a little bit. And, I, and this is what was the fifth defining moment of my life. It was understanding the unconditional, unbreakable love of Jesus for me. The church stuff was wearing me out, but the Jesus that I signed up for at 15 years old was renewing my mind. He was giving me a new life. He was giving me, at 30 years old, it was like being born again again, and I was like, it doesn't matter what people think of me, and I'm not saying that's the end of the struggle, but I know that I've been learning ever since about the grace of God, the grace of of Jesus Christ, the gospel of grace is actually more radical than my human instincts want to get a hold of. My human instinct wants to pull back into this legalistic effort world where I'm trying to be a better and better person. But really, the promise to the Christian is rest in Jesus. And Paul said, you guys are foolish if you want to add another rule to something Jesus did for your life, I want you to get excited again about the gospel of grace. Grace is unconditional, unmerited favor on your life. And if you've ever heard the gospel of Jesus and been stirred up in your soul, that was grace being poured out on you. Don't we understand we need more grace? It's grace that we need. It says, I'll move on. It says in Galatians chapter 3, verses 21 to 23, is there a conflict then between God's law and God's promise? There's a lot of territory that's covered between what I just read and what I'm reading to you now, but let me put the brakes on this section. Absolutely not. If the law could give us new life, if trying to live our best intentions of being a Christian, if that could produce life, we could be made right with God by just obeying it. But the scriptures declare that we are all prisoners of sin. So we receive God's promise of freedom only by believing in Jesus Christ. Only by believing in Jesus Christ. Before the way of faith in Christ was available to us, we were placed under guard by the law. I'm going to get back to this. We were kept in protective custody, so to speak, until the way of faith was revealed. Okay. Hey, listen, as a pastor, I think about the calendar year, and there's... The Word of God gets preached in lots of different ways. It doesn't get just preached from a platform. Can we say amen to that? You, you all, so many of you I know are on your Bible apps. You're, you're seeking after God. You're listening to podcasts. You're telling each other. You're texting each other. That is the Word of God. But in the church, let's be honest, the way that we build up so much of our faith happens on Sunday mornings. And I think of the 52 messages that we can preach on Sundays, and two of them are easy to figure out. 
One of them would be Easter. We're going to preach about the resurrection. The other one would be Christmas. And we're going to preach about the birth of Christ and how that fits into the gospel and how that is the Lord uh, uh, sending his son so that we can follow him all our days. And I understand it's an easy call on Christmas. It's an easy call on Easter. But let me talk to my elders and our leaders and talk to you about why do we focus on what we focus on sometimes. You know, what do, what do we do with the rest of these messages? Fifty messages. You know, the trick question is, what is the New Testament mostly about? It's about the New Testament. <laughs> about the new covenant that we have with Jesus. About something so radical that when it got preached about the goodness of God, Paul's life comes on, under fire. How is it that we preach about the goodness of God and people want to attack that? But that's what Paul was dealing with. And, and, and I know there's a danger, okay? There's a danger of over-representing one topic. We can make it all about one topic as we preach. But I just want you to understand that actually God's grace really is that extreme. We, we want to balance the grace of God and say, but what about my part? And we begin to do some things. And we, we forget, if you wanted to grow in your faith, you're going to understand more and more about the goodness of God. I have been changed more about understanding the goodness of God than feeling like I'm going to be punished and, and, and the fear culture that some, sometimes we find in church in America. How many people have experienced the goodness of God? It is so extreme. It is so hard sometimes for people to grasp, but it is so powerful. This is my belief. I believe as we teach grace, people grow. We grow. How come it's, how come in America, follow me, how come in America, in church in America, we can preach about purity, and yet there's so much sexual abuse in the church? How come we can preach about marriages in the church so so much and have marriage seminars, but the divorce rate matches the world. How come we can preach about the kingdom, and yet you find so much idolatry in the church? How come we can preach about the gospel, but end up finding that people are bound up in sin? What, what is what is what Jesus really doing here? I believe that if we can teach things, but without grace... Without grace, you want to be a better husband, you want to be a better wife, you want to be a better friend, you want to be a better Christian, learn about the grace of Jesus in your life. Learn. Now, we need those things. We need those things about our marriages and about our friendships. And we need those things. We need to be taught. But I'm trying to get here at Castle in the early days, in the pioneer days. Look around you. We, we're all pioneers. These are the pioneers that are trying to cut through some dense forest here. But in the pioneering days, I'm trying to make a point at Castle Church that we need to put both feet firmly on the ground on the gospel of grace. When you see his goodness, it makes you want to not do the wrong things. It makes you want to please him all the more. And grace begins to really feed the church. What Paul is saying here is when you add the law, when you add our self-effort into grace, it imprisons everything. So if you take law and grace, Paul said in chapter 2, I'm not going to make grace meaningless. Grace has a purpose. Grace has a purpose in our lives. And he says, I'm not going to take the law and grace. If I add into it the things that we want so desperately to grow in, if it's marriage, if I add into it friendships, if I add into it holiness, if I add into it anything else, law, grace, and these things, I'm just bringing it all into captivity and in jail. It's not going to be free. But it's so amazing that when you're operating and you get rid of the law mentality and you begin to have a reliance on Jesus and not a reliance on yourself, everything else begins to flourish. And that means your lives could begin to flourish. How many people want their lives to begin to flourish in Jesus? Let's just cause our lives. We want to see our lives grow. It is amazing how we are asking the most popular questions in Christianity, to, in Christianity right now center on, on sex or on marriage and divorce. 
But what Jesus addresses the most, the biggest topic, what, what we see here, in Paul, at least in Paul's letter, we're going to get into all that stuff. But what Paul focuses on is grace. Because it's from there that you can learn about the other things in your life. Because you know what? We fail in all the areas of our lives. I, I will fail in my marriage. I will fail in my relationships. I will fail in, in different areas of my life. But actually, grace, the Bible says where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And what Jesus teaches us is it's not about my performance. But if my heart is after God and I understand his grace, I actually, through the things that I struggle with and am weak in, I begin to learn about the strength of God. I just need you to understand that you need to focus on the grace of God. I need you to understand that Jesus wants you to understand about grace. I think, here's another thought. I think that sometimes the Bible says here in this this scripture says we receive God's promise of freedom only by believing in Jesus Christ. Why? Because all of us otherwise are prisoners of sin. Here's the thing. Here's the truth. It's almost as if when we sin, we like to focus on how, that sin and how we get over it. And we focus on our efforts to obey. And if I'm more obedient, maybe God will be more happy. This is the sin of my life. I'm going to focus on it. But what does what does Paul say? Turn your focus away from trying to be an obedient to sin because sin is so powerful it will make you a slave. Turn your focus away from your mess. We know we have messes in our lives. Turn your focus away from the unholiness in you and the things that you shouldn't have in your life. Turn away and begin to look to Jesus Christ. Amen. Look to Jesus. And he takes you out of the prison of sin. It's like people who try to act so humble. And they put on an act. And they're trying to obey something, but it's not flowing from the Spirit. When you have humility, it is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's there, amen? Kindness and goodness. It should be more effortless. But in the kingdom, so many times in church life, we're trying to make more and more effort. But it's about the grace of Jesus Christ. Abraham's blessing. He said to the people, you can have Abraham's blessing, a whole nother teaching. You can have it. Abraham was wealthy. He was uh, a healthy man. And I'm not so sure what I believe about the wealth and health. I don't believe in prosperity gospel. But Abraham's biggest blessing was his faith in the promises of God was counted to him as righteousness. It put him right with God. You receive the Spirit and the presence of God by faith. we got to get back to this. Say by faith. You receive the Spirit of God in your life, the presence of God, by faith. You began your new life. Say it. By faith. Here's one. You see miracles by faith. You live by faith. Under the law and our own self-effort, we void our faith in believing in God's promises because we're no longer operating in I trust God's promises. We're saying I operate in trusting in myself and I trust you. But I trust me and I trust you. Freedom is found all the way over here. I'm trusting you, Jesus, to bring a past your promises. Can we say amen to that? Can the musicians come forward? It says in Galatians chapter 3, Verses 28 to 29. In Christ's family, listen to this, in a, in a country that is divided by race and divided by politics and divided by so many things. It says, in Christ's family, there can be no division into, in other words, no segregation into, Jew and non-Jew, slave and free, male and female. Among us, you are all equal. Can you say the word equal? That is, we are all in a common relationship with Jesus Christ. And since you are Christ's family, then you are Abraham's famous descendants, heirs according to the covenant promises. There, there is, Paul's now making a shift as we come to the end of chapter 3. He's saying that your life to find real freedom 
is trusting and seeing God's goodness. When I was 30 and I realized I could just put away all the efforts of my own flesh and the stress of trying to be a good Christian, and all that that produces, that doesn't produce life, church. The law does not ever produce life. You want to know about the goodness of God? You begin to see the grace of God. And it produces something in you. It's almost like it's effortless. I'm not saying that you don't work. But I'm saying that there's a place that we rest. Oh, man, when we start resting in Jesus, we're going to stop judging other people. When we start resting in Jesus, we're not going to have a culture of condemnation. Because when you mess up, when sin abounds, what abounds more? Grace. The goodness of God. Some people will, will say, that's too radical. That's what they were saying to Paul. That's too simple, Paul. What are all the other things you should be doing? And Paul said, no, because people are going to fail. Has anybody had any failures in the last year? Do you sometimes have the regret that you did something that you wish you didn't do? Do you have some moments in your life? Well, Paul's beginning to make a pivot because he's saying, listen, I want you to believe in the foundation of grace. And then we can have some unity. Then you can have unity in relationships when you believe in the grace of Jesus Christ. How many people know that scene in Friends, that classic scene in the television show Friends, where they're trying to move the couch up the stairs and they're shouting, he's shouting, pivot, pivot. They're getting so frustrated because they can't get around the stairs. Pivot, Ross says. But it's like the church is stuck in the hallway and can't get up, can't go back down, and everybody's just shouting at each other. But what we need to get to the next step, maybe you feel stuck in your life, this religious stuff doesn't feel right. You want to know more about Jesus. If you want to know more about Jesus, hands up. To get out of this stuck place, to pivot into unity as a church, to pivot into good teaching about marriages and good teaching about relationships, to pivot into things that the church seems to be very weak at. I have a radical view. I have a radical view. I think we are weak at it, weak in it in this, in this country, but that God's reforming us and bringing us back to grace because you know why? Anything less than grace is foolish. It's foolish. Violet, uh, my niece, Louisa watches Violet. So Violet has taken over our home by storm by storm and uh, I'm pretty sure she's going to take over this church by storm as well I love the way she communicates she communicates with sign language at times and she's not just saying it but she, she'll also do the sign language and I think it's, I'm just so impressed I'm just so amazed by the, her ability to do that and one of her sign languages her expressions is the word more she'll say more and she'll, actually that's the sign language She's adopted it, and she goes like this. And it's so emphatic, too. She'll be like, more? And guess what I do? More of whatever she's asking me to do. She's there in her... Can we stand to our feet? She's there in her uh, high chair. And, you know, your family is probably just as goofy as ours. Like, we, we'll go up to her, and you know what? I'll even sing to her. Guess what she says? More? Even me when I'm singing. Ray, Ray you made, made a joke and said, why don't you come on up and sing? I was like, that's not going to be good for the church. But guess what? For Violet, more? Or when we're reading, she wants me to read her a book, and, and like all of us, and she'll say at the end of it, very serious, she'll be like, Or when we're dancing in the kitchen in front of her. She's watching us. And at the end of it, she says, You know what Jesus is asking of you today? What he wants to draw out of your heart today? This is what he really wants. He wants you to focus on grace and just say, More. 
I need more grace. I need more grace. It's effortless. She just sits in a chair. Tori, Ronnie, Louisa, and myself are entertaining her with everything we got. I was even juggling oranges. She just had to sit there and say more. Because you know what? Grace, Jesus doesn't, we don't belittle the king of kings. He's not just saying because you want the latest car. What grace operates is, is when sin abounds, grace abounds more. It exceeds the fallenness of my own nature. And when I've stumbled, I can go to God and say, more? When I've failed, I can go back to Jesus and say, more? When I'm struggling to believe something and I begin to walk in my own effort, I can say, more grace? When this relationship isn't working the way that I envisioned and hoped and wanted to, I can go back to him and I can say, more? And his grace constantly is supposed to be drawing out of us something. If your marriage is hurting, if your finances are hurting, and your faith is hurting, and your struggles and your doubts, like many of us are wrestling in it all. If you want to be stronger in your faith, you need to have the humility to go back to Jesus and just rest by faith the way you started your faith rest in him as you walk it out and live it out and you just look at him and you say with wonder, with joy with excitement about the goodness of God and you say to him I want more grace I want more of it I want more of it and that will get you unstuck heavy hearts that will get you unstuck doubting hearts that will get you unstuck it comes down to the grace of God and no one deserves the grace of God. No one deserves what he does for us. No one could ever do the law perfectly. If you miss one sin, you would be in violation of the whole law. But when we see our, look away from just our sin and we look to Jesus by faith, he transforms us. Can I pray for you? How many people want more grace this morning in your life? Father, we need you to illuminate us. We need you to open up our eyes. We need you to work deeper in our hearts. We want to learn this about grace. There's something to learn that we don't have in our spirits. Maybe like we should, but Lord, maybe for some people they can look back on my own testimony 15 years later after giving my life to you. It's when you really taught me about the unconditional, unbreakable love. And Lord, I pray that more people at Castle Church would enter into this unbreakable, unconditional, it's not my performance, not another rule, but a relationship with Jesus. Lord, I pray for this church. I pray for Castle. And I pray, Lord, for a radical change in our lives. We can't focus on this enough. If we preached it 52 times a year, everything else in our families would grow, Lord. And as we teach grace, we will grow. And I pray this church would grow. I pray our finances will grow, and I pray our lives will grow. I pray our health will grow. But, Lord, if all those things at times end up in problems and troubles because you said there will be troubles in this world, grace can still grow. And I pray for miracles by faith in this church. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Singers, come on.
creeds and colors Bind us together Make me a vessel of your love Pour me out Pour me out Pour me out Wherever I am Wherever I go Oh, my God.